Well, it's good to be good to be with you this morning here at Liberty. Good to be back here again in Convo as well. Appreciate the opportunity to share, uh, particularly on the the uh, most stressful time of the school year. I want to thank you for that, Johnny. And, uh, and and are you ready to go on fall break? All right, all right, all right. So 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 in conclusion, thank you for coming. God bless. You're dismissed. No, I won't do that. If you have a, no, I'm just kidding. Stay, 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 stay. If you have a Bible, take it out. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. See, some of you going over your Bibles or your phones. That's great. 1 Peter chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, repent and look on with someone nearby. And uh, we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 4. And I really want to encourage you. I know that your, your heart and mind is on exams and then exits. And I get that. Exams and exits are where you are. But I want to encourage you to, to kind of think with me about this issue of engaging all of God's people in God's mission. That's what I want to talk about today is engaging all of God's people in God's mission, how, how we might do that faithfully. First Peter chapter 4 has this remarkable picture of what that might look like. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 10 and 11, I'm going to read the text and we're going to sort of walk through it together. It says this beginning at verse 10. It says, based on the gift they have received, everyone should use it to serve others as good managers of the varied grace of God. If anyone speaks, his speech should be like the oracles of God. If anyone serves, his service should be from the strength God provides, so that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Pray with me. Father, by Your grace and Your goodness, You have redeemed us and called us by name. I pray You use this passage to provoke us to love and good deeds, as Hebrews reminds us. Open our hearts, open our minds to what You have for us today. Even in the midst of a day when our mind is on exams and exiting, I pray that You might focus us on this passage today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. It is kind of a remarkable passage, and one of the reasons it's a remarkable passage is, is that what it kind of describes is not what we're experiencing. It says each one should use their gifts to serve others as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Yet the reality is, well, let me, let me give you some statistics, right? I'm the president of Lifeway Research, a research company. Here's what we know. We know this from a study of 7,000 churches and a study we did for a book called Transformational Church. Here's what we found. The majority of people in the majority of churches are unengaged in meaningful ministry and mission. The majority of people in the majority of churches are unengaged in meaningful ministry and mission. I'll quote that. I'll, I'll quote a few other statistics. As the president of a research company, you have to do that every time I quote a statistic, an angel actually gets its wings. And so I'll quote a couple of those kind of along the way. But this passage is remarkable because this passage and our practice are a pretty big distance from each other. There's a chasm between the two. Now, what causes that? Well, we're going to look through four things today that might help us to consider what it means to see all of God's people engaged in God's mission. Number one, if you're taking notes first, all have gifts. Let's not miss this. The passage teaches here that all of God's people are gifted for God's ministry. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, based on the gift they have received, everyone should use it to serve others. See, this is important because it begins by laying a foundational principle and truth that if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a minister. Now, part of the problem is we've created an unhealthy and an unbiblical distinction that's not there between those who are called to pastoral ministry and those of all God's people who are called to ministry. There's a difference. There's, there's pastors as an office in the, in the church of pastors. But I want you not to miss this, that this passage says each one, as each one has received a gift, they're to use it to serve one another. So that means that you, if you follow Jesus, if you've been born again by the power of His gospel, you are a minister. It's not that the ministers are being trained in the school of religion. It's that all of us who name the name of Jesus as Savior and Lord have been called and gifted for ministry. It says, based on the gift they have received everyone. Now, why don't we, why don't we see that happening? Well, some of it's the language that we use. Right, so I'm, I'm a pastor, right? I, I lead a research company, but I'm also a pastor. I, I started a church a little over a year ago. I've been in pastoral ministry since, uh, since very, well, on the, on the whole journey of, of my adult life. And so I'm a pastor, so I'm, I'm clergy. And we use this language, it's unhelpful. I'm clergy, and, and some of you here are clergy as well. Some of you are ordained to the, to the ministry, which is a fascinating concept that's not actually found in the Bible, but, 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 but there is this idea that we're set apart for the ministry. And then the rest of you are what are called lay people. 
Lay people are not clergy. I'm clergy. Most of you are lay people. I'm clergy. You, not so much. So let's look at what that means. As clergy, in most people's eyes, I'm, I'm just kind of a little bit better than you, right? I'm clergy. I, I've been ordained. Someone has called me reverend. I mean, that's a sweet gig if you can get it. I'm now reverend. By the way, the only person the Bible referred to as reverend is God. But nonetheless, I'm a reverend now. And so, so I go around and I sort of clergy. That's what clergy do. I clergy. Right, I clergy at my church on Sunday. I'm clergy here a little bit with you right now. I'm just kind of clergy. I'm on a stage because I'm, I'm elevated because I'm clergy, but most of you are not. You are lay people. What do you do? Well, you lay around all the time. Right? That's what lay people do, right? And so clergy, a little better, a little more spiritual, a little higher elevation, right? And then lay people, not so much. Here's, here's the problem. A lot of people really believe that. And we use language like somebody asked me, Ed, when were you called to the ministry? And sometimes I inadvertently say between my junior and senior year of college. And that's wrong and it's unhelpful because no, I was called to the ministry when Jesus saved me. When he gave me new life, he gifted me. And in gifting me, he gave me a ministry. And I want you to hear this because that means all of us are called to the ministry. Let's take a look at the passage again. It says, based on the gift starting with the singular, the Holy Spirit gifting us based on the gift they have received. It's based on the gift they have received. And I'm, I'm trying to emphasize the D. I'm not trying to sound like a preacher there. But based on the gift they have received in the past tense, when, when you became a believer, you were indwelt with the Holy Spirit and gifted for His service. So whatever your major, whatever your school, whatever your focus, whatever you are doing, God has called you to the ministry. So, so what then, are, how are pastors different? Well, well, God's called them to the ministry too, and God has called them to the office of pastor in a local church. But this passage reminds us, as each one, don't miss that, as each one, it's reminding us over and over again, based on the gift they have received, everyone, it says, everyone. I looked that up in the original language in the Greek. I dug deep. And here's what it means when it's translated literally from the Greek. Are you ready? Everyone. It, it, it doesn't change. See, it doesn't change because even though our practice is far from it, so we studied 7,000 churches. Here's what we found. The majority of people in the majority of churches are unengaged in meaningful ministry and mission. They, 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 they come for the show, but they aren't actually involved in the serve. They come as customers of religious goods and services that are distributed well at a church they like. The music's the way they like it. The pastor preaches the way they want it. Their, their children are cared for the way they want it. And so they're customers of religious goods and services who watch the show but don't get involved in the serve. What I, what I would say to you is this, is we're in a great season of challenge, and my exhortation to you is to embrace, for each of us, all of us, to embrace that God has called everybody here who names the name of Jesus Christ, who has received the good news of the gospel, everyone here, God has called you to ministry. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 puts it this way, to each is given a manifestation of the Spirit to the common good. Every person who names the name of Jesus Christ here has been called to the ministry. So if you're going to be a pharmacist or a teacher, if you're going to be a lawyer or you're going to be a plumber, whatever it is God has called you to do, in the midst of that, God has called you to minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So my exhortation to you is to not join the hordes of passive spectators in churches across North America and around the world, but instead to live as agents of God's mission for each of us to say, God has called us to the ministry. So let's take a look at number two. Number one, all have gifts, but it doesn't end there. Uh, number, number two, that God intends all to use. It doesn't just that he's gifted us, it's that God has intended all to use. The second part of verse 10 says this, as good managers of the varied grace of God. So based on the gift they have received, everyone should use it to serve others. Serve is, is predominantly used of serving other believers, serving one another, but also beyond through the context. We see lots of examples of serving the poor, the hurting, those without. So in, through, and beyond your church, you serve one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And it tells us to be good managers of the varied grace of God. Now, I, I first became a manager when I came back for... Uh, after college, and I became a manager of the Burger King. And oh, that was exciting. I, I, was, I was the night manager. I was actually the assistant night manager, uh, which I, I, I actually found out meant guy who locks up at night and cleans up after everyone's gone. 
But I was in charge. I mean, I was in charge. It was me and the fry guy, and I ruled over him with an iron fist. I made sure that the fries were ready. He wasn't dropping them early. I was ready to go, keeping an eye on them. Why? Because my job was to manage. Well, the word manage in biblical times means pretty much the same thing it means in our times. It means that you steward or you manage something that doesn't belong to you, belongs to somebody else. That Burger King belonged to Davgar Enterprises. But my job was to manage it. My job was to be a good steward of that store for the benefit of the owner. Well, that's the word that Peter uses in writing to the Christians. He says this, be good managers of the varied grace of God. So the question for you and for me is not whether we are a manager. The Bible says we are. The question is, will we heed the biblical call to be good managers of the varied grace of God? So so we've we've all been blessed. We've all been Liberty students or Liberty graduates, right? So so, so we we have the opportunity to, 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 to have this teaching and this training, to hear the good news of the gospel taught and lived, and then we come out of that. And the only question is, will we be a good steward, a good manager of the gifts we have been given? And you know that difference between a good manager and a bad manager. You, you've been to the mall. You go to a mall, and, and a, the, the mall has spawned these things called kiosks. The first mall allegedly was from where I planted my first church among the urban poor in the inner city of Buffalo, New York. And while we were there, we, um, people from Buffalo, yeah. Uh, the, while we were there, um, there, there there's, the, Buffalo, it snows 11 and a half months a year. I mean, it's just constantly snowing. And, and, uh, and, and, and what, when they, there was a street on, down on the south side of Buffalo where they had shops on both sides. They got tired of it snowing all the time. So somebody said, let's just build a roof over the shops. And, and they say that birthed the first indoor mall. People debate where that, where that actually took place. But then the indoor malls birthed something else, the kiosk, the mall kiosk. Maybe some of you worked at a mall kiosk. You certainly shopped at one. Maybe you buy a, a cell phone cover there. I, I know I did last time. And so you go buy a mall kiosk, and there's, there seems to be two kinds of people working at a mall kiosk. The good managers and the bad one. The good managers might actually get on your nerves. They're, they're coming up to you as you walk by. Hey, you want to you come on over here and check this out? Or I've got this. And they're, 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 they're selling and, and being good managers of what they've been given. And then there's the, the, there's the other one. And he or she's just sort of sitting there on their stool, just, just looking unhappy. Kind of the products over here, they're facing over here, just miserable scowl on their face, reading a book. Generally not this book, but reading a book. And, and, and and you come up, and, and they see you coming up, and they just, they just subtly turn to the side, just kind of turn away. Now, now, here's the thing. Both are managers, right? But the only question is, is which is a good manager? The Bible does not say we get to have an option whether we are a manager. If you are a Christian, you have been gifted, you've been indwelt with the Holy Spirit and gifted for ministry, the only question is whether you're a good steward or a bad steward of the gift that you have been given. 1 Peter chapter 4 says you have been called to the ministry. John 20, 21 says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. John 20, 21 says you have been sent on mission. If you're a Christian, you have been called to the ministry, you have been sent on mission, the only question is where and doing what? That might be something on a factory floor where you live on mission, you serve others, you share Christ, and you minister outside of your job. It may be something you do inside of your job, but I want you to hear this. If you are a Christian, you have been gifted for ministry and mission. The only question is, how are you using your gifts? Now, the problem is this, is that that the church is filled with people who are gifted, yet the majority of people in the majority of churches are unengaged in meaningful ministry and mission. 1 Corinthians 12, 18 says, but God, as it is, God has arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. Now, here's what I want you to miss. God's going to place you as you follow his leadership in a church that is probably, he's going to place you there because he places us in the church that is probably filled more with passive spectators than active participants in the mission of God. I want to urge you, don't join the hordes of the passive, but provoke them to love and good deeds. Hebrews reminds us to provoke one another to love and good deeds. And so in doing that, we're going to encourage people to find their gifts and to deploy their gifts for God's great glory and God's great goodness so they can be good stewards. Listen, even the world knows, even the world knows there should be a place where people's talents and gifts are discovered and deployed for the greater good. Remember a few years ago, um, there was this video on YouTube that went all over the world called uh, about Susan Boyle. How many of you saw the Susan Boyle video on YouTube? Lots of you. For the rest of you, we're going to run electricity to your dorm at any time so you can actually watch this because it was on every, if you watch the evening news, it was there. It was on the computer, it was there. 
But if you remember, Susan Boyle, she sort of came from the side and she walked out into the stage. And as she did, um, Simon Cowell, who was on American Idol and Britain's Got Talent at the time, he's on neither now, but he was on both at the time. He, he, she walked out and the, the audience was already smirking when she walked out into the stage. They, they rolled their eyes, they, they scoffed. The camera was on this one teenage girl who sort of looked and just rolled her eyes. How dare she was thinking, you would assume. How dare this woman who, who's not attractive enough or young enough or articulate enough come out on this stage and think that she could stand before us. You saw it, and I don't know about you, but I, my, 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 my gut just tensed when I saw it. She walked out and she, she came up on the stage and, and, and Simon started to interview her in a patronizing way. Called her sweetie and said, okay, sweetie, what are you, what are you here for and where are you from? and she stumbles with her words and, and kind of reinforcing the stereotype. Maybe she's not the right person here. She says, I'm from a collection of villages and she stumbles through it. And, and, and so he asks her more questions. He, Simon rolls his eyes, and, 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 but he asks her more questions and finally says, what are you going to sing? And she says, I'm going to sing, I dream the dream from Les Mis. And Simon rolls his eyes. The judges smirk at one another. They know this is a difficult song to sing. And then the music starts. Dun, 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 dun. Hits the first line. And, and then she begins to sing at the second line. And, and she, she sings out and sings, I dream a dream in time gone by. And she hits that first line. And, and, and the, the camera goes right to the audience. And they are they're stunned. They're shocked at this very moment. Because out of this, this woman that they did not expect comes this voice that they did not anticipate. And at that moment, they, they sat stunned. And then she hits the second line, and her, her voice got stronger. And, and the people in the audience, they, they start looking at each other and saying, oh, this is unbelievable. And then it hits the third line, and, and there's these two guys backstage, and one says to the other, you didn't see that coming, did you? And you didn't. And I'm watching this, and over and over again, the camera, she hits the fourth line, the camera goes to Simon, and, and it's right on Simon. He actually, he actually smiles and nods. And for that moment, the earth just shook on its axis for just a moment. And, 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 and so she's watching this, and, and I'm watching this thing, and I'm just getting moved at the core of my being. I'm, my wife comes in, and she says, honey, who is this woman you keep watching on YouTube over and over again? Because I was watching over. I said, it's okay, baby. Trust me. And I'm watching this thing over and over again. And I'm not much of a weeper, but I start crying. So I'm in my living room watching. Soon I am crying like a 10-year-old girl at a Justin Bieber concert. I mean, I can't stop this. I am just weeping. I have a 10-year-old girl, I know. And so I am crying crying over this and, 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 and in the midst of this. And, and, and so finally, I mean, they just, the whole audience is on its feet and they're applauding and they're cheering. And, and if you've got any heart, you're weeping and you're cheering for Susan Boyle. It's a beautiful moment. To the world, that's a shocking moment on YouTube. To the people of God, we have church filled with people who are supernaturally gifted for God, for His glory, for His intent, and yes, they may be unlovely and it may be a surprise, but God has called all of them to use their gifts, including you, and then you to help them find their gifts. See, we've bought into the lie that our job is to go to church and pay, pray, and stay out of the way. That's not what God has called you to do. See, now, I, I, there's a difference between talents, in Susan Boyle's case, and spiritual gifts, and I don't have time to unpack all that in the time that we have, but we've bought into the lie in so many churches that God's agenda for you is to go get a real job, and then you go to church and you pay, pray, and stay out of the way. Can I tell you whether you're a plumber, whether you're a baker, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a banker, whether you're a lawyer, God has called you to minister to minister in, through, and beyond your church for His glory. So the only question is whether you're going to be a good steward or a bad steward. The question is whether you're going to join the idea of the customers of religious goods and services or whether instead you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, and yes, as a graduate of this fine institution, you will go to a church and say, you know what, I'm not here as a customer, I'm here as a co-laborer in the gospel. What are we doing for the ministry of His glory? And that's, that's my encouragement to you. That's my encouragement to me. Now, I, I, I think we're at a real challenging point in the life of our churches. If we don't deal with this, I believe what's going to happen is some of what we've seen in the research released yesterday was national use. You've been studying for exams. You probably didn't see it. But the rise of the nuns, the none of the aboves, and the decline of those who identify themselves as Christians. Now, one-third of those who are young adults identify as I'm none of the above. I'm not anything. I'm just spiritual but not religious. One-fifth of all, one-third of the young adults. And I think 
think part of the reason why is they have seen what we have offered them, which is churches full of people who sit there week after week and do nothing and call themselves followers of Jesus. And I don't think that's worth much. But the Bible instead gives a different picture. It says, based on the gift they have received, everyone should use it to serve others as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. As good stewards, and I believe if we don't deal with this, the future doesn't bode well for our churches. And I don't know the future, I'm not a prophet, I'm not the son of a prophet, I actually work at a nonprofit organization. But what I would say, But I would say this, is the future does not bode well when churches full of passive customer Christians are the norm, and I don't want you or me or my family to have been blessed as we have been blessed, to be redeemed by the power of the gospel and trained for service and end up joining hordes of passive spectators who are not active participants in the mission of God. Furthermore, I think we can be part of the solution, not just join the problem, we can be part of the solution. See, I think part of the challenge is a lot of church leaders and pastors are, are in a codependent relationship with their congregations. And I want to ask you to help break that. I want to ask you to help churches break the codependent relationship that they have with their churches. So, see, why, why, why is this the case? Let me explain codependence. Let me read it. This is a, a definition of codependence. I got this off of Wikipedia, so you know you can trust it. Here's what it says. It says, it says a codependent is one side of a mutually needy relationship. The codependent is then meeting the needs of the dependent who's the obviously needy party, not doing anything, maybe, maybe because of drugs or alcohol or finances or, or, or personal struggles, whatever it may be, the dependent person has become dependent on the codependent. Here's the problem. The codependent gets his or her identity from meeting the needs of the dependents. Well, the dependent receives that and, and they end up in this death spiral of unhealthy relationship. I've seen it in relationships, you have too, but I've seen it in churches where pastors and church leaders do all the work of the ministry. We even have a nickname for this. It's the 80-20 rule, right? 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. But what happens is those 20% of the people love being busy, doing all the work, and, and they get their identity from it, right? I love getting my identity from this. You just sit and be ministered to, but let me do the ministry. And then you become a key leader in a church, and you can fall into that trap as well, where you can get your identity being the only one who does the ministry. Can I just encourage you? This is why Hebrews tells us to provoke one another to love and good deeds. To provoke one another to love and God deeds, good deeds. Why? Because God has gifted you for his glory and for your good. Number one, all have gifts. Number two, God intends all to use. Number three, for which he empowers us. For which he empowers us. Look at me at verse 11. If anyone speaks, his speech should be like the oracles of God teaching the Word of God and the power of God with the clarity of the Scriptures. If anyone speaks, his speech should be like the oracles of God. If anyone serves, his service should be from the strength God provides. So our role is not simply to, to go to church as a customer of the religious goods and services, to go to the one we like, it has a, has a great band and has an you know, articulate communicator, but instead to be a part of what God's doing to minister to one another. How? In the power of God. He's empowered us for this. Whoever speaks, it says, as one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength God provides. So this is not intended to be a list of all the spiritual gifts in the Bible. We have lists in places like Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 and, and, and Ephesians 4. There's about 19 total in all. I'm not sure God's intending to give us because all the lists don't overlap perfectly. I'm not sure God's intending to give us a complete list of all the ways that he has gifted his people for ministry and mission. But there are diverse gifts. We, have, we find here that he gives two broad categories in 1 Peter, speaking and serving. Some of you will speak and God will use that for his glory. Some of you will serve in a myriad of ways and God will use that for his glory but in both cases, we do so in the power and in the strength that God has provided. See, when we don't, what happens is we do it in our own strength. We get burned out. We get tired. We lose the focus and we lose the passion. It's not to say it's always easy, but all believers are chosen, gifted, and called to ministry. And then in being called to ministry, we serve him as those who are empowered for his ministry, for his work. We find and deploy those gifts for God's glory and for your good. 
We need to do that in the Spirit's power. That's the only way we can do it because ultimately it's the Spirit who gifts us for such. So our task is not to be passive spectators. See, part of the way we build our churches teaches people to be passive spectators, right? I mean, this, this is not a typical uh, what a church building looks like. I've actually preached in a, in a church or two that, that looks or feels like this, and, and they kind of build it like a stadium. Most of them build it like a theater. And let me tell you what I think about buildings like this for worship. Here's what I think about this. I hate them. See, now, now, now I, I'm never getting invited back now, am I? No, I think I will. You guys have some pretty creative invitations you give out for convocation, and so I might get an invite back. But, but I look at this building, and I don't like, here's why I don't like it. I don't like it because it's built like a theater, and if you build churches like a theater, don't be surprised when people act like showgoers. You say, well, Ed, you know, what, what, how are we going to do this if we, if we build churches and we, we, we line people up in rows, particularly those of you folks on the floor? This is what a typical church might look like. We're lined up in straight rows like shelves at Walmart facing forward. Your job is to be passive spectator while the musicians and the pastor get up and teach. And, and what I would say to you is when you build churches like theaters, don't be surprised when people act like showgoers. You say, Ed, what's the alternative? I don't really have an alternative. I just wanted to complain about the current situation. Is that all right? Maybe, maybe, maybe you've been there. I'm kind of like a good church member. I just bring my concerns. I don't bring my solutions. But, 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 but again, actually, to be fair, I think you have a wonderful facility. It's, it's, it's good. And, and I'm kind of a hypocrite because I actually just planted a church that meets in a, in a, well, in an actual literal movie theater even now, right? So we, we, but ours has reclining seats and cup holders for our Starbucks coffee and, and, uh, you want those put in here today? Would that be a good thing for them to put those in here in the Vine Center? You'd like that? See, but I know and you know that in doing so, what it does is it teaches the people of my church, Grace Church, that their job is to be a spiritual sponge. They sit in the comfortable chairs that ours even recline. They sit, they soak, and they sour like a spiritual sponge. And, and the end result is, is passive spectators rather than active participants in the mission of God but God has instead gifted you. So you have a wonderful Vines Auditorium. I'm just having a little fun. But I want to say to you this is that when we go to church, we sit in places similar to this. And don't be surprised when we build churches like theaters that people act like showgoers. When we call clergy, clergy, and lay people, lay people, but the clergy don't think they're the ones who are the ministers and nobody else is. And the lay people aren't happy to allow that to happen. See, that's what happens in codependence. With codependences is that I get my identity, and if you're a key leader in a church, as so many of you will be, or a pastor, as some of you will be, what happens is you will get your identity from meeting the needs of the people, but God has called the people to actually meet many of those needs. I was the interim pastor of a church, and interim pastor is a fascinating job. Um, interim pastor is what you are when uh, the last pastor has left, in this case died, and so you sort of fill in. I filled in there for a couple of years, and it's a wonderful church, a gospel teaching and preaching church, and, and one Sunday they have what's called a, uh, an altar call. The church actually didn't have an altar. It had a carpeted step, but they nonetheless called it an altar call, and, and so they invited people forward. Well, after the altar call one day, uh, a, a young family came up to me. There were, there were two young adults and a, and a young boy. I call him Johnny. Say he was eight, and they came up afterwards, and they met me right down front, and they said, they said, brother, they call me Brother Ed. I'm from, uh, I'm from Long Island outside of New York City. And so I don't, uh, I, I, you know, the brother, when you say brother, the brotherhood where I'm from is actually the mafia. And so they, uh, they, they, but they call me, they call me Brother Ed as they do in the South. And so I, I, I said, I said, yeah, talking to me? Yes, Brother Ed. He said, we, little Johnny's here. He's eight years old. Uh, we'd like to meet with you. He has some questions and he's ready to receive Christ. And, and so, and I said to them, I said to them, I was very nice about it, but I, I, I kind of worked up to it, but I actually said to them, I said, no, 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 you don't, you don't want me to do that. You want to meet with him. I mean, don't, you don't want me, I mean, you, but you, you talk to him and you pray with him to receive Christ. And I mean, what a wonderful opportunity. I don't want to do that. And you do that. And, and, they, and they looked at me with this look of horror. I mean, it was just, and already, I mean, I was a Yankee preacher in Tennessee. They already didn't like me. And so they looked at me with this look of horror and, and, they, and they said, they said, but but Brother Ed, he's, he's got questions. And I responded to it quickly. I said, but I mean, he's eight. Are they hard questions? I mean, is he struggling with the ontological arguments of the existence of God? Is he kind of unsure about it, whether he's lapsarian in his views? I mean, what's the issue? Is it Arminianism and Calvinism? I and mean, what's the big problem with the eight-year-old? All right, I didn't say all that. I thought a lot of that. 
I mean, they've been going to this church for two decades. They love the Lord. They've been under good teaching and preaching. And, and so I said to them, why don't, why don't you go home and, and, and tell them? And, and oh my gosh, I'm a, they, they were not happy. They went home that afternoon. I know for a fact they called two Sunday school classes full of people and called me the Yankee devil interim. Well, not the Yankee devil part, but they didn't like me. They told a whole bunch of people this. But I was convinced that if we're going to see the church move from being a bunch of passive spectators, that children should be led to the Lord by their parents, particularly when they've been in the church for 20 years, hearing the gospel teach, uh, taught, and preached. And in the midst of this, we've got to move from the idea that only the pastor can lead people to Jesus. Listen, if you have to bring your friends to the pastor to meet Jesus, somebody's confused about who's who in the gospel. There's only one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus. And you, you can introduce your friends to him. And I'm encouraging you to live on mission and to live as agents of God's ministry in such a way that you take up the mantle God has given you to show and share the love of Christ to your neighbors, to minister in, through, and beyond your church. Now, if I would have met with little Johnny, they would have said good things about me to everybody, but instead they said bad things about me to lots of people. They would have praised me and I would have gotten my codependent fix out of that. I would have seen myself as indispensable, thought how wonderful I was to lead their son to Jesus. They would have told everybody that, but I didn't. And two weeks later, I saw them come up after the service again. They were making a beeline towards me and they said, Brother Ed. I said, yes. So, and I didn't know if I was in trouble. I didn't know what was going to happen. They looked enthusiastic about something that could be good or bad. They said, Brother Ed, we just want to thank you for not robbing us of the opportunity of praying with our son. And we got a little, little beclimped right there in that moment, uh, a little misty, because it was a wonderful thing. Because they knew that they could lead their son to the Lord and their neighbor to the Lord. And now here's the thing, they didn't go and call back those two Sunday school classes worth of people that they called me on two weeks before. See. When churches decide that they're not going to be distributors of religious goods and services, but instead places where all of God's people are equipped for permission, is a lot of the customers will get mad. I want to urge you, I want to ask you, and I want to urge you to be among those who aren't the upset customers that the customer service has been decreased, but instead you're not a customer, you're a co-laborer provoking one another to love and good deeds in the church, ministering in, through, and beyond the church. Why? To bring God glory. Fourth and finally, let me close with that, and I'll close with this. And Number four, if you're taking notes. Number one, all, all have gifts. Number two, God intends all to use. Number three, for which he empowers us. Number fourth, and finally, to bring God glory. You know what it means when a guest speaker says fourth and finally? Absolutely nothing. But let's give it a try. Because school's almost over and you get to go home soon. You know, I could have my feelings hurt by your applause and your cheer right there, couldn't I? Number one, all have gifts. Number two, God intends all to use. Number three, for which he empowers us. Number four, to bring God glory. Don't miss this. It says this right after. So that in everything, so that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So what does the Bible teach? The Bible says this so clearly. We love singing. We had a wonderful time of worship here. It was a wonderful opportunity. I saw many of you engaging in worship, even in the stressful time of the exams and soon to be leaving for for fall break, but you worshiped. Why? Because you wanted to give God glory through song. And I say amen and praise God, but this passage says, so that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So what's the so that? Serving. We serve others so that he might receive his due glory. You want God to receive his glory in the church? You want God to receive his due glory in the church? Then you and I live as those who are not customers, but who are co-laborers, who break a cycle of passivity in our congregations and move people from being passive spectators to active participants in the glory of God. God has gifted you for his glory and for your good. Why? So that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Would you use your gifts to bring God glory? That's my encouragement to you. And in the midst of doing so, in the midst of doing so, we might change a church culture that's filled with passive spectators rather than active participants in the glory of God. Don't join the horde of passivity 
and said, join Jesus on mission. Respond to the call he has given you to minister. Use the gifts he has gifted you for. Pray with me. Father, by your grace and your glory, you have redeemed us and called us by name. May you remind us all, everyone, that God has called us, God has redeemed us, God has gifted us, and then you have sent us on ministry, called us, and sent us on mission. May you receive the glory so that in everything, so that in everything, you may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen and amen. God bless.